live from Calabasas, California. And a McDonald's. It's Juicy Scoop! Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. Well, I just want to start out by thanking everybody um, for your well wishes. If for some reason you're not aware, our beloved Simba was killed by coyotes last week on Tuesday night. I didn't share it until Friday via Patreon and social media. Kelly made a beautiful tribute video. She also brought me this photo to keep here in my office. And um, I'm not going to get into the sadness, but, you know, it's really hard, especially when you have kids. And um, anyway, I just really, really, I got, I saw all your messages, so many, and I just really appreciate it. And I'm really grateful that we have our dog Raven to love on. So also another update, the Andy Cohen update. Andy did write me a very nice email and so did John Hill in a nutshell, both just saying like, you know, that they were being snarky and I was right and that that wasn't cool and then a bunch of you guys wrote me and said that you did love me on the Zoom happy hour with Jeff Lewis. And again, thank you. I'm glad I, I I shared my thoughts. I'm glad I was heard. And I appreciate Andy for taking the time to write me. And um, so, and, oh, and by the way, Potomac just started. Real Housewives of Potomac. And I'm going to probably cover it next week when we get a little more into it. But that, that's going to be a real treat, you guys. That, that show is really, like, coming to its own. Um, or I might share on Thursday, but I need to, like, study it a little bit more to fill you guys in. And I want to give you a minute to watch it because it just came out Sunday. All right, guys. Brian Callen. He is a comedian. He has a very popular podcast called The Fighter and the Kid. I was on it about four years ago. I know him from Chelsea Lately. You may remember him, Sex and the City people. He was the bad guy in bed that gave Carrie like a neck whiplash. And then she had her neck was all hurting when she went to some, maybe it was, I don't know whose wedding it was. I don't know if it was Charlotte's wedding or if it was something else. But anyway, she went to a wedding and was like, her neck was all hurt. And uh, okay, well, let's get into it. LA Times. Amy Kaufman is a writer for the LA Times. She also is a huge Bachelor fan who wrote a really great book. And she came on Juicy Scoop a couple years ago, and I interviewed her. And she wrote the article about Chris D'Elia and all of his accusers. And um, when, you know, when it came out, I wrote her on DM, and I was like, wow, this is a great article. And she said a lot more people are coming out um, to share their story you know, what do you think? And I'm, and I said, you know, for me, I've never been part of that boys club. They're not my good friends. I'm not part of that group. I didn't hang out at the comedy store every night, but when I did, which I've shared with you guys, yeah, there was inappropriate talk and things, but I never took these guys seriously. And, um, I never like didn't have stage time because I didn't cooperate. However, I think when there's certain people that this is their MO and then there's certain you know, vic victims or, you know, that get succumbed to it. It's just, it's not what has happened to me. But let me just tell you what this article says. So there's a few incidents. They, they call it sexual misconduct because nobody is filing charges against Brian Callen. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, it, it, they're not. But still, you can tell your story. And what makes her reporting so important along with Roan and um, Pharaohs is when these stories come out of these incidences that happened many, many years ago, one thing that these reporters do is they say, okay, this happened in 1999. Who did you tell? Well, I came home and I told my roommate, my mom, my sister. They then call the roommate, the mom, and the sister. And in all of these cases of these women that are speaking out against Brian Callen, these people go, yes, I remember this from 2006, from 1999. I remember where I was when she called me and she was distraught and told me the, the exact same story that she's telling you 20 years later. And I think that's really important because people are saying, you know, in, in, in his defense, like, oh, my God, why now? Why all these years later? And it's like, well, sadly, you don't get over this shit, you know, and 
She chose the first girl who is saying that he raped her. Her name is Catherine Fiora Tigerman. She decided to come forward because when the Chris D'Elia stuff started to come out, she really was like, you know what? I'm going to share my story because – and this was interesting because um, – because Rose McGowan tweeted the article as well, and she said, calling these monsters out is an act of love for the younger you that you that got hurt. So when people say, why, if you're not going to sue or press charges, it's like, no, I want my story told. I want to tell my younger self, um, I love you. This happened. I'm acknowledging it. I'm sharing the story. I'm not ashamed of it. I wasn't ready to share it then, and I'm ready to share it now. So this, I'll tell you, go through them all. So this girl, Catherine, she told the LA Times um, that in 1999, she was an aspiring actress. There was some backstory where, like, her father knew Brian, and they were, you know, similar age. And he was, you know, on the rising rising up as a, as a comedian, not famous yet because it was 1999, um, but getting there, doing, doing good, getting acting roles. And they went out for like a friendly dinner. And then afterwards, he was like, oh, do you want to see a movie? And this was back then where you have to look in a paper to see where it's playing. So they were going to go get a paper. And then he goes, let's just go back to my apartment. I have a paper there. We'll look for the movie there. And when they got there, according to Catherine, he, um, she went to the bathroom. When, he came, when she came out of the bathroom, he like forced her on the bed and forced her to have sex. And while she kept saying no, no, she actually recalls watching like a law and order of something where the rape – victim kept saying her name like this is me this is Catherine please don't do this stop stop kept saying her name over and over and when it was done he said um we just had to get out of the, out of the way what you think I'm some big bad rapist you're my girlfriend now we'll be boyfriend girlfriend now well she insisted they take her home immediately she never saw him again he continued to call her she you know did not respond but she did tell a number of people, a boyfriend at the time and a couple other people. And they said, you should do something. You should tell. And she said, no, please be my friend. Just be here for me, basically. And I'm not going forward with authorities, which I think we all can relate to that. So now what's interesting about her is, and she said years later, he got on Mad TV. She actually was on Mad TV for a while, but they never worked together, I don't think. But years later, she was up to play his wife in a sitcom pilot. And they, when it gets to the end, you do a chemistry trust me, test, meaning you read with the person to see if can you guys gel together. They're not going to just give you the parts without reading. And she was horrified. And she was at Mel's Diner. And she was like to her friend, I can't believe I'm going to do a chemistry trust with the person who raped me years ago. I don't even want to do it. And these people that she shared it with who then – Con, you know, confirmed the conversation with Amy Kaufman of the LA Times. They both said, no, this is a huge opportunity. This is a lead in a sitcom. You're at the last round of auditions. You really could get this. And if you don't do it, you know, then he's won. And if you get it, it's just so huge for your career and it could empower you and you're taking care of your elder, elderly mother. Go for it. She did, and unfortunately, she didn't. She was so nervous and freaked out, rightfully so, that she did not get it. And I, I mean, I don't think the show went anywhere anyway. Way, but he, Brian Callen, did respond to this accusation and saying, "Like I categorically deny that this ever happened. This is not what happened. We had consensual sex. And besides, she tested to be my wife for a TV pilot. What rape victim would go and work with their rapist again?" Hello, the Harvey Weinstein trial, everybody. Um, it happens a lot. And also, let's just talk about what it is in Hollywood. I mean, we're talking about a lead in a sitcom, people. Hundreds and thousands of dollars. If this is to go to syndication, it's a it's lifestyle change. It could be generational wealth. Like if you hit like a, you know, everyone loves Raymond kind of a show besides what it would do for your career. And this is what you're fighting for. It's not like these opportunities come every day. It's not like you're, you're folding jeans next to a real creep at Nordstrom who rapes you. And then you're like a couple years later, I'm folding jeans next to that rapist again. Let me just quit my job and go work at Neiman's. Okay. And not even that would be a lot of a big challenge. So the other, so she goes on with her life, gets married to Tigerman, her husband, 
and has now decided to share her story, which he, Brian Callen, totally denies. The other stories are um, sexual misconduct. One was a girl was working at American Apparel. Her name's Rachel Green, and she recognized him from his acting roles, um, Brian Callen, and he came in, and while she was, like, bringing him some clothes, he shoved her in the dressing room and tried to kiss her and grab her and grope her, and she obviously remembers the incident, and so do the two or three coworkers that LA Times was able to, again, confirm that at that moment she told two or three people, and they all confirmed the story, but she did not go to authorities or anything. Now, the other person... Um, was a woman named Claire Gunshirt, something like that. She was 23 and a barista. She ran into him. She waited on him. She recognized him from the Sex and the City role. And he was married at the time, but they went on to have a consensual four-year affair. But what she said is that he would say things about women that women have a primal desire to be raped. Um, she said he said that in 2016. He has since, we looked it up, I didn't even know he was married, but he and his wife, I think they have children, they got divorced in 2020. Probably were separated for a year prior, than, prior to that, but that he is in fact divorced now. Um, and then there was one more. Oh, then there was this other girl named Tiffany King who was an aspiring stand-up comic. She was going through divorce. She was Moved home to the East Coast, but she was friendly with Brian. She saw that Brian was playing at the Helium in her town. She reached out to him, showed up at the club, and was like, can, any, can you help me financially? Like, I'm struggling. I'm going through divorce, trying to keep custody of my child. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, trying to be a stand-up. Like, you're attractive. You're not using your attractiveness to the best of your ability. Let's go out to dinner after the show. He takes her out to dinner with his opening act. And on the way home, she's driving them back to their errand. Airbnb, and she claims Tiffany King claims that the um, that uh, the opener says, "Oh, let me out!" like a block before, and then at that point, Brian Callen says, "Give me a blowjob, and um, I'll give you some stage time this weekend, and I'll also pay you." In which she declined. Now, the guy who opened for him, who has a record, claims that never happened, and he was in the car the whole time. So. Here's the thing, you know, a lot of people that are in defense and he even says, Brian's like, this is cancel culture. I'm going to, I deny all of this. This is not me. This hasn't happened. And, you know, we, there's a lot that kind of tracks with it, with his behavior. He did a episode of Whitney Cummings podcast in which they laughed together about how he sexually harassed her early in her career and she said, do you remember when you asked for a ride home and then you took out my your dick? Does that sound familiar? To, isn't that basically what Tiffany King said, that he asked for a ride home and then uh, presented her with his dick? And Whitney turned him down and he said, well, I don't remember that, Whitney, but I believe your account. And jokingly is like, yeah, I'm, I'm creepy. I own my creepiness. I've always been like that. And... You know, certain girls have a relationship with the boys club and they can roll with it and they don't take it offensively and doesn't mean that they're any better or worse than any other woman. That's just their relationship with these guys. And I don't think they think, oh, my God, you did this to me at that moment. Who else are you being a horrible creep to? Maybe you're being horrible creeps to women that don't have the backbone that I have that don't, you know, that can't tell you you're a fucking creep, get away from me. And so, you know, I just think in this situation, he decided he made a statement yesterday to the cameras denying it. And then he also said, um, I'm going to take a break from my podcast. Now, he and Chris D'Elia had a really fun relationship that a few months ago, when before all this went, I really enjoyed their brotherhood and the fact that they would bust each other's balls and do all this fun stuff on social media and make fun of each other. I just thought it was great. In light of all this information, yeah, it's not so great anymore. And, and Netflix agrees with me because they, I guess, had a show in the works to do a prank show together, which was removed right when the Chris D'Elia stuff happened. Also... 
um, Brian Callen, within days of the Chris D'Elia stuff, scraped all of those fun videos and little pranks that they played on each other. He removed all that from his Instagram. And, um, you know, and then it's like, so here's the thing. Uh, I personally think if I was his advisor, I would say, sure, if you want to take a break from the podcast, fine. But I kind of think probably the better thing is to just keep going because if you're denying it, just keep going with it and just be like, hey, you don't want to listen to me anymore. You don't want to listen to me anymore. Um, I think that's what's interesting about his career. I mean, you know, he can't go out and do stand up as of now. He got, um, you know, he had now the, the podcast is gone. The show is gone. I think I think if he's got the fans and they want to listen to him, just like Louis C.K., he'll be able to come back. And if you did enjoy him and now you're grossed out and you don't want to listen to him anymore, then you don't have to listen to him anymore. Um, you don't have to watch his stuff. You don't have to endorse him. You can take him off your Instagram, just like all these other people. So with the cancel culture, there is a level of it. But then also there's so many people that aren't truly being canceled. They're not like losing their job hosting a TV show with a huge contract, and now they have nothing else to fall back on. I mean, Brian is a kind of a self-made person, though he does act a lot. So um, we'll see what happens. I mean, there isn't charges or anything. It's this. It's these people's stories. I went on Twitter. There were a lot more kind of misconduct and and things that he supposedly said to people that they recall. Um and, you know, people, other people saying, I, it just doesn't sound like him. He was so great to me. Well, yeah, it doesn't mean that that doesn't take away from any of these other women's stories. You can still have your story in which he was a total delight and great. I did their show. They were great. They were fun. A lot of people got to know me from being on Fighter and the Kid. I appreciate it. I had a fun hour with them, um, both of them. Um, but, you know, this... The facts are, to me, I believe that these are facts, and I think there's things to build them up. And I think it's, you know, horrible behavior. So that's my opinion with that. Speaking of more horrible behavior, Ellen DeGeneres. Okay, this has been going on now for months. More and more articles are coming out about Ellen. First, it started with a thread. Um, you know what's, what's kind of amazing? It's kind of like, on a much worse note, but how... Um, with Bill Cosby, it took the one Hannibal comedian, his name's Hannibal Buras, a uh, comic, to just like do a throwaway joke is remember when Bill Cosby raped people and like everyone's no one really cared. That started the entire investigation in where now Bill Cosby is, you know, dying in prison. The Ellen thing kind of started with someone on Twitter saying like, hey, I've got a I've got a horrible Ellen story. Does anybody else? That all got out. She's been keeping her show going, I guess, at her mansion in Montecito. Um, there was some controversy over, did she screw over camera people or whatnot? Um, you know, not using the proper people. I'm not really sure where that led. And now the latest thing is that all these staff members have come out and said that they were treated horribly. There was sexual harassment. There was discrimination. There was racism. Um, all stemming from the three main EPs. And now those three EPs said, we're horrified. We've worked here for 10 years, done 3,000 shows. If even one person was unhappy for one day, we're absolutely horrified. And we're going to get to the bottom of this. And she is kind of throwing them under the bus, being like, I had no idea. I can't be there all the time. I put these people in charge, and I'm absolutely horrified that anybody didn't have the greatest time of their life working on my show. So I think um, this is all so interesting because TV is very different than any other working environment, a TV show, whether it's a sitcom or a daily talk show. And one of the reasons is is a Supreme Court case that we would refer to as the Friends case. And there was an, um, a woman who was a writer's assistant who worked in the writer's room of the hit TV show Friends. And she filed a lawsuit saying that she felt 
that there was sexual misconduct, misconduct basically, and that she was sexually harassed because of the, the you know, stories and the language that we used in the writer's room to talk about everybody's sexual stories and whatnot, and that it was very offensive to her, and it should violate sexual harassment laws of NBC. Well, NBC defended themselves, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that a writer's room doesn't have to hold itself to the same type of standards as other businesses because it should be a safe place where people can share their stories and their life and their creativity so that they can write these stories. And going forward, anyone that's going to enter that kind of experience should know that they're going to be privy to hear some things that might to them be offensive. So you should know that. So there's that being said. But also being on a TV show, I really feel like it stems from the top. I think um, I'm just remembering this now, like. Ross Matthews had a show, and they were on a different floor than us, if you guys remember. When I was doing Chelsea Lately, Ross Matthews had a show for a few months. And he really ran it interestingly. Now, he wasn't on for seven years, but he was on for like six months. And it, he had like daily check-ins with the staff. How's everyone feeling? Ever, you know, what's bothering? You know, what's the positives? How can we positively reinforce each other? He was creating a staff that really um, reflected his own sensibility and it was showing in when you'd go to the third floor versus when you would go to the fourth floor where our show was. And um, and it was different vibe. And then as, as years go by, I think just like a family or a classroom where no one's checking up on it and the teacher is a certain way – it kind of can become like a systematic kind of a, a bullying situation. And um, I think the stories of Ellen's strange personality, I think, bled into those three producers. And I think there's one story where one of the producers was screaming at a staff member who ch ch was sharing her story and Ellen was laughing. And I just can really relate to that situation. And see how people wouldn't want to stand up for this other person because then that puts the target on you. And everybody is trying to save their job, their ass, their, that they get picked up for the next round. These are extremely hard, coveted jobs to come by. You work your whole life to be in a position to work on a, a TV show like that. And even though you might be like, hmm, I don't think this is really appropriate. You're not ready to leave. You suck it up. And you go with it. And maybe you go up to that coworker afterwards and you're like, hey, you rub their back. Or you're just like, hey, are you okay? Can I get you a coffee? You know, I'm sorry about that, that we all had to witness that. And then – and and nobody blames the others because we're we're all just trying to save – you're all just trying to save your ass. One of the things that she did that I read that I thought was very interesting is you guys remember – a big funny thing that everyone loves from The Ellen Show is that she loves to scare her guests. So whether it's like Kim Kardashian being afraid of a snake or someone's afraid of frog she, or someone pops out behind the, the, you know, the couch where this person is, they, she loves scaring people and pranking people. And um, there is a philosophy, a psychological philosophy that thinks that's pretty fucked up and think that's thinks that's pretty weird, that it's only a certain type of person gets off on that. And um, it, it is kind of weird. It's not, it's not real comedy. It's like it's at someone else's expense completely because you're scaring them. And, you, and then there's been stories where, like, I think sometimes people knew this was happening, but they had to act more scared just to, like, please the child who is Ellen who's playing this prank on them. And... You know, I remember um, on my show, Chelsea, lately, there's a whole book about it, The Lies That Chelsea Handler, Handler Told Us. And I was lucky enough to write a chapter f based on three lies that she told me that I did believe the whole time. And I had a fun time writing the chapter. And I was happy to take that on. But looking back on it, you know, approximately eight, nine years later, and in the Ellen thing, it was weird. Some of the things were... Um, the, these lies, and one of the lies that happened early on that was featured in the book was she was dating Ted, 
and he was the president of E. And there was some story like it was she basically called him and she's a good actress and she's hysterically crying. And she makes up the story that a dog, a friend or an actress's dog, someone they knew, got into some food that Chelsea had and he was allergic and now he's in cardiac arrest. And she's terrified. She's like, am I going to go to prison? Did I possibly kill this animal? What's PETA going to do? And we're listening to this like on speaker, all hiding our laughter. And Ted is being super nice. And he's like, no, it's, it's going to be OK. Don't worry about it, honey. We're, it's going to be fine. But we're not going to say anything. We're never going to say that it was your food. Nothing. I'm sure the dog's going to be fine. Then like the next day, she says, no, the dog has died. And on Sunday, and she's crying, and on Sunday, we're going to have a funeral for the dog. It was like this bulldog on Santa Monica Pier. And he's like, all right, we'll go. And now the producers are going to hide their cameras on Santa Monica Pier on Sunday. So this went on for like four or five days. And we're going to use it for an opening on Monday's show. And I have to say, I laughed at it too. I don't know. I just laughed because... You know, she's funny. The way it was shot was funny. We're all in on this together. The dog is safe. So then they're walking up and he's in a suit and she's in a beautiful dress and she's kind of looking at the camera, like holding back her laughter. And then they just hold up a sign of the bulldog that says, I'm alive. I'm still alive, sucka. And he's like, oh, you know, Chelsea. And <laughs> I don't know. I w I've always wondered did he kind of know or suspect and, you know, just loving her just like went along with it? Um, this was one that didn't like hurt anybody. Sure, it took up the producer Sunday, but we got a great bit out of it on Monday. So and everybody that watched it thought it was funny and everybody that saw it at home thought it was funny. I, mean, I don't remember getting any kind of thing like, wow, that wasn't very funny to just make up a weird lie like that. And then I remembered like I kind of started to do little lies like that with Peter and he's like, I don't find that funny like how is just making up a lie out of nowhere a comedy bit and I was like yeah you're right that is kind of but what I'm trying to say is like you start to just get into this like mode or this this idea of things of what is okay and what's not and what's funny and and it stems from her so now she's supposedly really distraught I mean she's so rich she's 65 she recently did an article a few years ago that she hates the dancing and she hates when people walk up to her and say, Ellen, we love you. Can you dance? She's like, no, I can't. I might just be done with the show. You know, she's done with it. So there was an article saying who would replace her. And there's talks that it would be James Corden from The Late Late Show, which is weird because I think that's on CBS and her show's on ABC. But maybe his contract is up or maybe it's some parent coming. I don't know. I actually think he'd be a really great um, substitute if you want a big name because – I think he has the same like happy vibe that she has. And I think they'd want to keep the show, the happy vibe. I hope that the show just doesn't go away because, um, you know, there's all those people that would like to come back and have their jobs. Uh, however, I predict that the, all the EPs will be gone. And if they do replace that spot, it's not going to be called Ellen. It'll be called James or something. And obviously he'd be bringing his staff. So... I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I just think like this is such a weird time and there's a lot of things that just have come out because we've had this time and it's like, oh, fuck it. Let me just tell my truth. I don't give a shit anymore. Like and and some good will come out of that. And and but mostly I think truth is coming out of it now. I shared with what the Internet detectives have shared with. They believe that the scene may have been taped after Rome where Kyle reveals what happened between she and Denise when they hooked up. I've done more research. I'm not totally sure if that is correct. Numerous cast members that were part of that shoot have denied it. And I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It really, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. One of the things I found interesting is my question was, whether it happened or not, who cares? Why? My question is, why did Brandy decide to share it after all that time, um, you know, she's like, I really haven't talked to her since. However, 
we saw Denise be very nice to Brandy at the at Kyle's party. She wasn't blowing her off. Um, and I think that's why Denise is so shocked that this news is coming out. Whether it happened or not, I think she's really surprised that uh, Brandy has decided to reveal it. And one of the things Brandy said is, Denise screwed me over. And I was like, how did she screw you over? And this is what I think. And this is just my theory, okay? They share an agent. And right before Corona broke, Brandy and Kim Richards were going to do a show at the Irvine Improv called Blonde and Blonder, kind of like what the OC girls did, where it's just like, ask us a bunch of questions. We come out. They've also done a bunch of those type of um, housewife shows, but it's through a, like it's like through a producer. They do it, Mohegan Sun, whatnot. They were going to do their own because I happened to listen to that episode um, early on in the coronavirus, you know, shutdown, and Brandy was so sad that it got canceled, hoping to that it would be rescheduled. Kim agreed, and this is what I think. Again, I have just my theory. I think that at one time, Brandy presented that idea to Denise. And Denise was like, totally, oh my God, we'd have so much fun. Yes, let's do a couple live shows. And then as it got closer to it, Denise, maybe after the hookup or whatnot, maybe was just like, no, I don't think I want to put myself in that position to be on stage answering questions that could get me in trouble. I'm really busy. I have these three shows. Maybe she was working on something else. I think she said no to Brandy after Brandy was really counting on it. And obviously, Brandy and Denise is going to be a much bigger draw than Brandy and Kim. And I think Brandy was pissed. Like, you said you were going to do it. Now you're pulling out. And... um and I think as more time went on and then she wasn't talking to her as much, I think she got really pissed. And then they booked the show and they're like, "We let's get on Real Housewives a little bit. Kim's like, hey, I'm getting my tits done on the show. I'm getting my teeth done on the show. Kyle and I are good. Kyle's bringing me around a lot. Um, you know, I think I think you should share your story. Why the hell not? What have you got to lose at this point, Brandy? And Brandy was like, you're right. What do I have to lose? I know the truth. I'm going to tell the story. So I, th I, that's, I think she's telling the truth. But I was just really wondering, why would she ever share it? Why would you break the girl code? It wasn't on camera, all of that. And I think it has something to do with Blonde and Blonder, which was going to be their show. So tell me what you guys think. I'm so excited, you guys, for you to see my stand-up special. Coincidentally, I did tape it at the Irvine Improv, which is a great place. Some of you were there. It shot beautifully. It is available August 7th on Amazon Prime for rent or purchase, or you join Patreon, patreon.com slash Juicy Scoop, and you get every all the back episodes of that for the last few years, as well as a special. Just spread the word. Watch it. Enjoy it with your friends. Let people know this Friday, August 7th. Um, it'll be available, heathermcdonald.net. I'm very excited. I got to talk to Captain Sandy, and this interview is very good. And you can tell she's um, a little stressed about some of the feedback she's been getting lately this season. And I think that she was so gracious and so smart and really a super inspiring woman. Um, and she she answers her questions and... It's just great. So here we go with Below Deck Mediterranean Captain Sandy.